Hello. In this video, we are going to be uh, covering the main differences between discrete circuit design and integrated circuit design. So, discrete versus integrated circuit design. Uh, the reason why we're covering this topic at this point is because a lot of the techniques that we have studied in the previous videos um, are pertinent to discrete circuit design, meaning circuits that are designed to be uh, perhaps built on a PCB board, and so they comprise a series of discrete components placed on the PCB board. Um, in what follows the next set of videos, we are going to be talking about uh, circuits or design techniques that are meant for integrated circuits. And those are circuits that are built on a single piece of silicon. So, for example, when you buy um, an IC um, for an op amp, let's say, that will be an integrated circuit. All of the components of that amplifier are built on a single piece of semiconductor. Uh, there are going to be different characteristics of discrete circuits versus integrated circuits. And when we are designing, we are going to use techniques that take advantage of those different characteristics. Um, and so that's why it's important to know what, why we're using the techniques that we are using uh, when we're working with discrete versus integrated circuits. So let's start with uh, discrete circuits. And I'm going to say PCB because most of those will be mounted on a printed circuit board design. Versus integrated circuit. Or IC design. And before we go to the design techniques, as I mentioned, we're going to take a look at the different characteristics so that we can put those design techniques in context. Uh, first of all, discrete circuit design uh, is board level design versus integrated circuit, which is chip level design. And what that means um, is that when we are doing discrete design, we rely on the range of devices that are available. Um, and so, rely on available devices, let's say. For example, uh, you can use resistors in the values that are available, the standard values or combinations of those series and parallel combinations. Whereas in integrated circuit design, you can uh, design the geometry of your devices uh, to generate virtually any value that you need. So you have control over the device geometry, which is related to the, to the values for those devices. Um, in discrete circuit design, we are able to find components that have precise absolute values. Um, you're able, for example, to find a resistor or a capacitor with a certain value within a certain tolerance. Um, in uh, IC design or integrated circuit design, it is more difficult to get components that have um, a precise absolute value due to uh, process variations. However, we are able uh, to get good matching between devices. So if we are building two devices on the same piece of silicon using the same process, uh, those process variations are going to apply to both devices. Um, and therefore, those devices are going to be well matched, even if their absolute value um, is not within a certain tolerance, the matching between them may be within a certain tolerance. And so that means that in discrete design, we're going to be using techniques that rely on uh, good absolute matching, uh, or excuse me, good absolute value of uh, or precision of values. Uh, whereas in integrated circuit design, we're going to be relying on techniques that, um, that rely on good matching between devices. So how can we write this? Uh, good absolute precision, but poor matching.
Whereas in IC design, we have poor absolute precision. But inherently, we have good matching between devices. Um, another difference is that in discrete circuit design, uh, we are able to use relatively large uh, capacitors and resistor values uh, without suffering any, uh, any consequences. In IC design, uh, it's going to be impractical to build uh, capacitors that are larger than hundreds of picofarads. Um, and then resistors, large resistors are impractical, but resistors in general are going to occupy um, a lot of real estate in an integrated circuit. So we are going to try to stay away from resistors um, and try to replace them as much as possible with transistors, which are going to occupy much less space. Uh, so we are able to, you know, large R and C values are possible. Here, um, large RC values impractical. So capacitors less than or equal to hundreds of picofarads. And then Rs, um, as much as possible, we are going to try to replace with transistors. We may not be able to replace all of them, but we are going to try to use design techniques that replace uh, the maximum number of resistors with transistors. Um, and then uh, another uh, big difference when it comes to design is that in the case of a PCB, uh, we can do a lot of um, trial and error testing on a breadboard. Uh, whereas in IC design, uh, we don't have that benefit. We cannot just breadboard our circuit quickly to see um, whether what we are thinking matches uh, what we are uh, seeing in the real world. And therefore, we're going to be relying much more on simulations. And nowadays, uh, simulators are very advanced, so this is not a problem. But yet, there are going to be um, some things of just building a real circuit and dealing with troubleshooting it that are not going to be as visible. And so you will see that in IC design, uh, there is a lot of an iterative process uh, where you design something, you get it to work in the simulation, then you go to the circuit to characterize your circuit, and gee, there is something that is not you know, quite like the simulation showed, and you may need to do a second pass. You're trying to avoid doing a lot of design passes because there is a time cost as well as a, um, a monetary cost associated with it. Uh, and so what that means is you're going to rely a lot on circuits that have been already uh, tried and, and tested, and you're going to work on improving those, not so much designing from scratch. Uh, but basically, in the discrete circuits, we're going to write it's possible to breadboard your circuit. Uh, whereas seeing IC design, you can't breadboard. And so you need to rely much more heavily on simulation. All right, so these are some of the differences. Uh, what this is going to imply, as I said, is just different design techniques uh, for your discrete circuits versus your integrated circuits. In discrete circuits, that is what we have focused on so far, uh, we see that we typically use circuits that involve or include transistors and a combination of resistors, capacitors, and you know, not so often um, because of the difficulty of designing with them, but also sometimes inductors. And as I said, we're going to have, or, you know, not rely necessarily on good component matching, uh, but rather we're going to rely on a precision of absolute values. In integrated circuit design, uh, you will see that in our design techniques, we're going to try to use uh, mostly transistors, because we can build them in small sizes, uh, and then we are going to include, just because we don't have a, a, a choice, uh, few and small resistors and capacitors. Uh, inductors, for the most part, are impractical, even though you will see inductors in some RF integrated circuits, uh, but not in the types of circuits that we're going to be uh, talking about in the next videos. And then um, we're going to see that the design techniques rely heavily on good component matching. That is so important that I think I'm going to annotate it again. So in here, the design techniques um, for component matching 
good absolute position. And in the case of ISIS, um, good component matching. Core absolute precision due to process variations. Um, now, you may say, well, aren't there the same process variations in the design of discrete devices? And yes, there are, but you need to understand when you are uh, picking a discrete device and it comes with a data sheet with a maximum and a minimum specification, uh, those devices that have been sold, that you have purchased, have been tested to those specifications. So any devices that have fallen out of those ranges because of process variations and whatnot, those have been already discarded. And that's why the absolute values or the absolute precision can be much better. Uh, in addition to that, uh, before shipping, then the devices can be tested to different precisions. And so you may be able to buy devices with smaller tolerance that are the ones that have uh, been tested and, and shown to have um, tighter values. And then uh, devices that are guaranteed to um, uh, a larger range of values, those will, have, will be sold as a different tolerance of device, etc. So uh, the reason for that is you know, not something inherent to the nature of the discrete device, but rather the fact that they've been uh, pre-tested before being shipped. Whereas in the integrated circuit, uh, they haven't been tested. They're just being built on the silicon for you. Now, some of the um, techniques that we have seen uh, for discrete circuits have been biasing techniques. And if you remember, the biasing technique that we were using most often with discrete devices or with discrete circuits was the four resistor biasing network or the voltage divider biasing network. With integrated circuits, we are going to be using a different type of circuit uh, or a different type of network to bias our circuits. We're going to be using current sources. And so biasing is going to be used during current sources. Uh, because again, we want to reduce the number of resistors and the four resistor biasing network uses nothing less than four resistors. So a lot of, lot of real estate. Um, the other thing is for our coupling of signals. Uh, we have been using a lot of um, coupling as well as bypass capacitors. So we've been using coupling and bypass capacitors. Uh, which, if you recall, uh, had you know fairly large values in the range of microfarads. Um, and in the case of integrated circuits, if we ever need to do that AC coupling, it's typically going to be uh, performed outside the chip, because inside the chip we don't want to have um, capacitors with those large values. Um, anyway, so this is you know covers a little bit of an overview of the differences. Uh, now. I talked about the difference in biasing techniques because that is the first type of circuits that we are going to study um, as integrated circuits will be uh, the techniques for biasing or current sources. Uh, now, remember that when we were biasing a transistor, all that we were doing was uh, setting a particular value for the collector current. setting our quiescent collector current IC. And in the discrete design, we did it using a particular resistor network. Uh, the four resistor biasing network was an example of that. In the case of the ICs, we are going to be using a current source. So let's imagine I have my transistor, an MPN transistor, and my VCC, my RC. And again, uh, let's imagine I have set my, uh, my input signal to go into the base. And so I can now bias my transistor by putting a current source in series with it of a certain current. Um, IQ. 
And if I connect it in series with my transistor, that automatically sets my quiescent collector current for my transistor, this, assuming that this is a DC current source. Um, and so what we're going to be focusing on are different configurations for current sources uh, that, you know, may be uh, more or less suitable depending on different uh, circumstances. And so we're going to study which ones are better for what. But in essence, what we're going to be dealing with uh, in the next set of videos is different designs for a current source that can be used in this fashion, that can be connected in series with a transistor uh, to basically bias the transistor as an IC biasing technique. Thank you.